Welcome to the series finale of the DWOS Diaries. What fun it has been to go down memory lane and catch up with some of the unique characters in the 10 year history of Dancing with Our Stars. And who else to wrap it up, to close it out with, but none other than Jody Wire is joining us for a third time on the DWOS Diaries. You're really, really bearing your dancing soul to us here, Jody, on this. Uh, hey. Yeah, I am bearing my soul on this thing. <laughs> well, we appreciate it. And of course, couldn't do it without you. And you have uh, arguably the most stories of anybody having been a part of it for all the years and mm -hmm. participating a few times. And so our second uh, interview with you wrapped up with the 2014 team, which of course you were a part of. And now we are going to focus this one on 2015 through the finale in 2018, and then life after Dancing with Our Stars. So plenty to cover in this episode. We'll get right to 2015, and it would see a, a sparkling familiar face return, that being Peter Murgatroyd. So worked really hard to, to get her to come to 2014, and she was such a hit that we knew that we wanted to bring her back again. And so glad that she said, yes, absolutely. I love Green Bay. Bring me back in the dead of winter and uh, experience. Uh, all oh, that there is no she uh, she never said that but it was great to have Peter back and we uh we had one one heck of a party with Peter the night before the <laughs> event at 335 again yeah and a handful of, of photos to share from to share from that fun night here in uh in just a moment So back at 335, and this party was hosted by Tracy Noss. She was one of the star dancers that year. And it was uh, Valentine's weekend again. So uh, I know Chris had the restaurant open, serving Valentine's meals. But we had a private uh, private table yeah. up to the side for PETA. And it was about 10, 10 to 12 folks mm -hmm. who were part of that. Uh, a part of that intimate evening and you and I were going there just to just to say hello greet everybody and uh and then be on our merry way but Chris Banglis strong-armed us into staying he said you're not going anywhere come on you guys and it was yeah he was pumping out a five-course meal with wine pairings Chris always does it to the hilt uh to the tilt whatever you're supposed to say whatever that saying is uh he did it all the way and so okay twist our arm Exactly. You, you Rain Segelski. Rain was Tracy's professional partner, and I. We uh, we we sat sat right out up at the. I don't know. You, you wouldn't call that the bar. I don't know what do you call that. The, the kitchen seating area, right there by the open kitchen. Yeah. And we uh, we wined and dined all night long, which was a great time. So a nice photo of us from upstairs. Yeah. And then tell me about this picture. What what's going on in this uh, in this moment? So it's Jim Revit who danced as a part of my season, and his mom loved Peta. And so Jim was like, "Would you mind if I get her on the phone? Will you talk to her?" And it was the sweetest moment ever. So Peta's talking to Jim's mom on the phone, and Jim's recording it. Uh, and I'm recording it, and uh, we I actually after uh, posted the video, and again, it's just the sweetest thing. I think I remember she didn't mom didn't know who it was calling at first, but uh, then she realized it was Peta, and I know that Peta met uh, Jim's mom the previous year when Jim had uh, you know helped bring Peta in, and she sat at. She had dinner at one of Jim's tables, and I know that uh, I think his mom was a part of that, so she was able to meet her in person. But then, yeah, how sweet. What an unexpected moment for, for Jim's mom to get that phone call. Exactly. From Peta, yeah, which was, it was a pretty special moment. Which was really cool. This was a little bit later in the night. Uh, a little bit later, yes. <laughs> we should have been gone well before then. Yes, we should have. <laughs> should have been gone well before then. Of course, Tracy right there in the middle and her husband. Yeah. But it was fun. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. There's no doubt about that. And Mangles so, definitely knows how to have a good time. <laughs> yeah. And so back to Jim. I have to give him credit for one of the more 
uh, fun picture sequences that I've ever been a part of. Uh, well, after we see Chris and Peta again. Sorry, Max. Uh, they were friends first. <laughs> So Jim is taking pictures of us, and he gets the bright idea, and he says, why don't you, you two should, like, pretend you're going to kiss? Uh -huh. And, of course, I, you know, I'm single. I'm like, ah, yeah, this is a great idea. And, thankfully, Peter played along. We kind of joked at first, and then Jim nudges, oh, come on, come on. So I'm like, okay, what do I do? You know, so she puckers up, and, you know, I, I, maybe I went too far, you know. And, you know, obviously, <laughs> he, he grabbed her by her pretty face. And uh, to Jim's credit, he continued to, to snap. So there was this. And then, you know, I'm still serious. But, of course, you know, Pete is like, are you, are you freaking kidding me? <laughs> oh, God, don't do it. He's like, no. <laughs> and then we both, okay. And I just, you know, I, I, both of our reactions. Uh, oh. she's, she's laughing so hard she's turning her head. Yeah, Jim had a way with the candids. He certainly did. But a uh, great photo here. Of, Who is uh, that? guy in that photo <laughs> yeah i needed I, I needed to eat about 50 five course meals uh that night that's that's back when i weighed about uh, i don't even know if i weighed 140 pounds there but oh gosh <laughs> yeah so uh so a lot of, a lot of fun that night and uh, a little too much fun as we uh, as we mentioned which made saturday uh, it was a little rough setting up a little rough was, but i <laughs> It was a little rough, but you made it. I, I didn't. I, uh, I, I didn't make it as well as you did. But thankful for a solid team that stepped up, where, uh, where I couldn't step up. And mm -hmm. uh, I guess we'll just we'll leave it at that. So grateful, yeah. grateful that everybody knew what to do, and and I, I filled in uh, sparingly. That was a very hands off production for me that year. <laughs> here is backstage and uh yeah go through what do we what do we see here yeah again we have such a phenomenal volunteer team and a lot of these individuals are there year after year and i think that's why the event just really came off so seamless because everybody knew what to do year after year because we like i said we typically had the same amazing crew and, you know, PETA, thanks to her generosity again, you know, taking a volunteer photo with everybody, um, you know, you just can't say enough about how nice and gracious she is uh, every single time she came in. And that red chair that she's sitting in, we would raffle that chair off. It was donated by KI. They donated all of the... Uh, uh, the chairs for the judges, but the one that Peta sat in, we would raffle off and she'd sign it um, and somebody would get it. That was all, all part of the polka with Peta raffle, one of the, one of the prizes. Mm -hmm. And the uh, champion that year raising a little more than $60,000 from WPS was a friend of yours. So tell us who she is and, you know, talk about what it was like to see this moment. That was such a great moment. So Ann Vandehei won the Mayor Ball Trophy from Wisconsin Public Service. And I knew her back from my Bell and Health days of working out uh, there. And I mean, I can't say enough about Wisconsin Public Service, Carmen Lemke, and just how much they supported this event right from the very beginning. They supported me as a dancer in the year I danced, and then obviously went above and beyond in supporting Ann. And, um, and it showed with uh, her being the mirror ball champ. Absolutely. And there's, there you are with Anne and Carmen. Yeah. So wonderful group of ladies right there. Absolutely. And while Anne won the mirror ball, somebody else cleaned house on the dancing awards. Oh, yes. Lisa. When I, when I went backstage um, where everybody was getting dressed and everything, I remember seeing that costume like hanging up um and sometimes i don't know like who's wearing what and so i'm just like oh my gosh who is wearing this <laughs> so i bow down to lisa because <laughs> she rocked it <laughs> it covered uh you know in this in this era of social distancing it's all about what's essential and non-essential well that outfit covered the essentials and that's it the bare essentials <laughs> uh, she was smoking in it 
-hmm. Yeah, she uh, she was a judges judges cho choice champ and uh, people's people's choice champ. Uh, it was just uh, nobody was going to stop her. She absolutely blew yeah. it away. Blew it away on the dance floor. She was fantastic. So 2015 comes to a close, uh, that event, and uh, the winds of change were blowing for you and me. I made the decision to start my own business, Rallyman Entertainment, and thankful that my first client was the American Red Cross. <laughs> they wanted me to continue to produce the event, and I was happy to do so. But it also opened me up to be able to pursue other opportunities, uh, other consulting options and you know, dabble in my roots of radio, television production and whatnot. And obviously I continue to do that today. So I, I left Red Cross as a full-time employee, but still was living the DWOS life. And a few weeks after I left, uh, you were on the move as well. Tell us about that. Yeah. So, I mean, for me, it was just after going through my season in 2014, it was a really just transformational year and I just felt like I kind of I felt like I've kind of done all I could in the Green Bay community and I'm so blessed again for my 20 something years there and just the friendships made and the experiences and just um, how everybody has supported me in all of my endeavors but I was ready to spread my wings a little bit and um, the previous year I've was down um, with a friend who was training for Iron Man and um, just kind of fell in love with the city. And so I decided to make that transition. And um, there happened to be an opening on the biomedical side of the American Red Cross. So even though I was moving, I was still with the organization. So that helped in that transition. And then it also helped for me to continue on to be a part of Dancing with the Stars in a similar role that I had previously when I worked for the Northeast Wisconsin chapter. Yeah, even though you weren't uh, working for the chapter in communications and volunteers, mm -hmm. uh, we weren't going to make that change. You, uh, you had a well-oiled machine, you and I made a really good team, and so why, why break up the team? So even though you're in Madison, it was business as usual, and we'd conduct meetings this way, you know, video chat, phone calls, mm -hmm. a lot more emails as opposed to in person, but uh, the train didn't stop. It just kept plugging away and uh, running successfully. And I really tried to make a commitment, too, to still support all the dancers, because I knew how valuable that was, and it was my opportunity as well to getting to know each dancer, because that's the fun of this fundraiser is just those relationships that you made. So I made several trips back. Oh yes, yes you did. Different different fundraisers, kickoff. Um, you know, I wasn't. You know, um, you couldn't keep me away. <laughs> no, not at all. We didn't want it. We didn't want to keep you away. So 2016, we uh, not only were you and I on the move, but the venue moved somewhat. We were still at the KI Convention Center, but now the Grand Ballroom, the new Grand Ballroom, was built upstairs on the second floor. And that became our home for the final three years. As I talked about with Jason from Lighthouse in his DWOS diaries, it was a pain to get the equipment from the ground floor upstairs, but it was certainly worth it, at least in my opinion, because it was a ballroom. It, you know, yeah. it had a lower ceiling and had better acoustics and had better aesthetics. And I just, I absolutely love everything about that room. I love the, uh, what am I trying to say? The reception area with the big yeah. glass windows that look out. Uh, yeah. I love the backstage area. So uh, those river rooms, that's what they are. They have uh, floor to ceiling windows that show off the Fox River and downtown Green Bay. And they served us well as far as dressing rooms, yes. 
and a green room and then being really close to the ballroom. And I know we had a similar setup downstairs, but again, it was just uh, so much nicer upstairs since it was new. And uh, Those halls were like wider and longer too. Yep. And that was always our big issue is trying to funnel everybody into the, the, to eat. And when the program started, everybody was out socializing and out at the bars and trying to corral everybody in was oh, ridiculous. But it was. up there, it definitely was a little bit easier. And we learned some things along the way too, of just, you know, shutting down the bars and make people get stuff inside. And uh, so you just, you know, learn things as you go. But yeah, it was, there were, there were no backups, you know, bottlenecking. We had bottleneck issues downstairs, mm -hmm. but upstairs people were way spread out and we could fit more bars in too because yes. it was so huge. And, you know, I mean, it's Wisconsin. People like to drink. It's like uh, <laughs> perfect timing, right? And it's, the middle, time. and it's the middle of winter. So they're itching to get out, get dressed up, and have a good time. And we have a couple cocktails. We're more than willing to uh, hydrate them. <laughs> Play host. <laughs> so the 2016 team would feature the return of one of the founding fathers. And that, of course, being Jim Gagnon. He was on the committee. We talked about that in the first of your three parts uh, episodes. And yeah. So Jim teamed up with... Uh, his, his wife. wife Maureen and danced. Yeah, it was neat to see, um, you know, them as a couple and a partner dance together. Jim did what as a pro partner uh, with Diane Roundy, so it's not like he has wasn't familiar with that role. Um, but what a neat thing to go through. Uh, well, I hope that Lisa was with your spouse. <laughs> and of course, the second husband wife team. As yes. we talked about in your second episode, uh, Rick and Suzy Beverstein yeah, performing yeah. together. Mm -hmm. But uh, these two, coached by Terry Irwin and TC Dance, and uh, it was it was neat to to see the two of them. Yeah, they're beautiful together. See the two of them perform, and on that team, that's the Mirrorball winner, Karen yeah. Clausen, SKB Management, and she she really came out of nowhere. I. I don't want to say she was the last person recruited to the team, but I know she was pretty late in the process and need to give credit to Janet Golnick, who was uh, the owner of Dance Sport and part of that team that helped create the event. At this point, Janet was pretty hands off, but she reached out to me in the middle of the summer looking to talk about dancing with our stars. And I had no idea you know, what it was about. She said, I've got a lady who I think would be interested in participating. Karen had lost her husband a few years prior mm -hmm. uh, to a heart attack and was just kind of coming out of that and looking to put herself out there in this type of a way. And being the owner of an apartment management complex, she's certainly familiar with the Red Cross because Red Cross responds to a lot of fires at apartment complexes so she it was a cause that she got behind right away and ended up raising ninety thousand bucks which yeah, again what a what a blessing because you know she was not somebody that was on our radar yeah and you know thanks to janet for being able to, to put that in there and that certainly was a, a huge part of that year's fundraising mm -hmm. and then that picture reminds me too that we had um cammy and tammy as our uh announcers too yeah, and this was actually their second year together. So 2015 was their first. I did 2014. Yep. And then uh, that's the same year that Tammy danced with you. And I just thought, you know, I I enjoyed being the host, but it is a lot. And I knew that she really enjoyed the event. So I thought, what the heck, you know, and she's, she's way better looking than I am. So <laughs> yes. <laughs> let's put let's put her out there. So yeah, it was the Cammy and it was the Cammy and Tammy show. Just before the awards for this, I recognized all the alumni who were in attendance. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> when you all were lined up, uh, you uh, you were standing by Jim Rivet, and yep. I can't remember. Did I say something to you, or was it you that said, "Boy, I hope he doesn't ask me to do something because I really have to do something else." 
Mm -hmm. uh, it ended up happening, but walk me through all of that. Yeah. Well, you kind of talked to each one kind of down the line and I was like, oh my goodness, if he asked me to do the splits, I can probably get back down, but I can't get back up. And uh, so we're, we're standing there next to Jim. I said, okay, Jim, if he asked me to do it, I can do it. I said, but you have to lift me back up. <laughs> so I just whoop, go down and hence uh, the expression on Tammy's face. And, um, and thank goodness, Jim was there for me to get me back up. <laughs> well, an iconic moment for sure. And a lot of people enjoyed that. All right, so 2016 is wrapped up. And now uh, 2017. And uh, in my discussions with the American Red Cross, I said recruitment these past few years, starting really after your guys' year. You guys set the bar so high that people were intimidated to take part, even though we weren't asking them to raise half a million bucks. No. But I get it. There is this perception now out there in the community. While well, Rivet raises two hundred thousand, the whole team raised half a million. I don't want to follow follow that up. And so recruitment for that year was tough, but we ended up pulling together, I believe, nine people. Again, you know, two thousand sixteen recruitment was tough again, but we were able to get a team of of folks, and the writing was on the wall. And this is one of those events that does have a shelf life because one, the community is only so big and two, the commitment that you're asking people to do it. If you really put your heart and soul into it, it can become a full-time job. And you know, you're working with people who are already working full-time jobs and usually demanding full-time jobs. Plus they have families with kids and they have activities to do. So where do you fit in dance lessons and fundraising and all of that? So I reached out to the Red Cross and I said, two things. One, we need to make a move to ease, uh, make, make recruitment easier. And I propose creating DWS teams where, and I said, so first of all, let's participants up until this point had been doing two dances. And I said, you know what, that's a, that's a huge commitment. I mean, you're talking probably 40 hours minimum in mm -hmm. the, in, in the ballroom dancing. So I said, why don't we scale it back to just one dance and then recruit teams? So a team would be you and me and we're fundraising together and all of our money goes into a pool. And I thought, you know, one dance and you have a friend that you get to fundraise with, that might take some of that pressure off, make it a little bit more fun. And it did help with recruitment, but then we did also get people who were just individuals who didn't have a teammate and I thought about it, but I really didn't want to pair up perfect strangers, if you will, just mm -hmm. because you don't, you just don't know how that's going to turn out. Yeah. And hey, we can make whatever rules we want. So I said, okay, we'll do two divisions. We'll still give out a mirror ball for the individuals. We'll have a group of individuals and then we'll have a group of teams and we'll do, do a team mirror ball. But I also said to the Red Cross, okay, so this is now going to be our ninth season. 2018 will be year 10, mm -hmm. an iconic number. And I said, I really believe that should be the finale. Now, when I first started, I actually had the idea of, so that was year five, my first year. And back then I had the idea for doing an all-star event in year 10, where we bring back previous participants. But of course, at that point I was naive and I thought DWOS would go on forever. I thought there'd be 50 seasons. But at this point I realized, no, year 10 should be the finale and we do, an all-star event, bringing people back. But because of that, I said to the Red Cross, we need to make that decision now. We can't make that decision a year from now in yeah. February and only give us a year to plan and reach out to people because the people we're reaching out to have done it before and they know how big of a commitment it is. So they may need a year's time just to figure out if they want to do it. Yeah, exactly. Thankfully, the Red Cross agreed. They said, yep, yeah, let's, let's go forward with it. So I began the process of planning two events at the same time, but I, I love the whole DWS world. So it was a lot of fun for me. So not only am I recruiting for 2017, but I'm also reaching out to all the past participants for 2018. And there were a handful of people who stepped up right away and said, yep, absolutely. No, no brainer. I want to do it. Others who said, give me some time to think about it. And then there were some who said, heck no, I am not <laughs> doing that again. 
Hmm. Well, I was in. <laughs> you, oh, yeah. We knew you'd be in. We knew you'd be in and you had to be in. Absolutely yes. no doubt about it. So uh, 2017, as we noted, uh, the team mirror ball went to uh, Stacy Stecker and Chelsea Anderson. Stacy from Associated Bank, Chelsea's mom, Tracy, worked at Associated Bank, dance career. My season. They raised about 66,000 bucks. And then the individual mirror ball went to Jim Knopf, great guy from Surf Pro. I think he raised about $25,000. And then we announced, so we had kept it out of the public knowledge, aside from my private recruitment of people, we didn't say that 2018 was going to be the finale until that night. Um, until the night of the 2017 event, I played a video. And at that point, I think I had 10 to 12 people who had committed. And, and that was part of the video that showed their names. I'll never forget the, the, the gasp or sigh from the audience when I went out there and I said, 2018 will be the 10th year and it's going to be an all-star edition as well as the last dance. And it was just like, Oh, you know, and that was, I got chills just now saying it because it was, I mean, I, I was very sad about it, emotional about it. I kept my emotions in check there. Um, well, and you and I, we discussed it. I mean, we were, you and I were just the most involved in it. And so from that aspect, I really think we had a good handle on the trajectory if we, if it could sustain. Yep. And, and, and it just, it just run its course. Like you said, you know, Green Bay is such a small market and we just, we just really tap people out. You know, we tried expanding a little more, like getting the Valley and some of those, you know, areas involved, but it just not quite. We could get level. one, maybe two people yeah. from the Valley each year, but it wasn't right. like. We ju it yeah. just didn't quite take off as much yet. So yeah. Yeah. It was, it was a sad day too in my world, but, but I knew, I knew it had, it was the best. So that video plays, and then after the event, I mean, immediately after, I think three or four people came up who were alumni, and they said, I want in, I want in, I want in. So all of a sudden, the, the numbers started growing, and mm -hmm. eventually we would, we would get to 20. Yes. 20 participants, 18 of them had previously been involved, and then two of them were, I call them pinch dancers, a reference to baseball pinch hitter. Um, representing somebody who had previously taken place that they had some sort of a, a connection with. So 20 people, uh, a part of the finale. And we'll get to that team in a, in a moment, but I also wanted to go big and bring PETA back because you, you got to go out with a bag. That's, yeah, and that's my last year. By this point, she was married to Max Schmerkowski, also from Dancing with the Stars. And I said, I want to bring him in as well, because he's never been here before. And no offense to PETA, but the majority of people attending our event are women. And I think that they would really <laughs> love to see Max in person. Oh, yes. <laughs> so negotiations for that uh, began. And I traded a handful of text messages with PETA back and forth, trying to negotiate what the appearances would look like. And we finally agreed on, uh, on a deal. And awesome. I make, uh, I make the public announcement. Pete is coming in. Max is going to be with her. It was in early July, I want to say. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I, get a, I get a text message from her. Well, I, I don't get text messages from her for a while. And, and I'm writing her and, and I'm thinking, what's going on here? And then finally I hear from her. Uh, and I told this story in the diary with Dan Terrio because he was with me. And she's like, you know, I'm so sorry, but we're planning to do a tour, a, tour, a dancing tour. And it's going to be starting in January. And for us to halt production to make it to your event, it's just not, it's just not, it's not adding up. You know, it's, it would, it would be, it would be very tough for us to make that work. Of course, my immediate reaction is like, oh boy. But I am a problem solver and I don't take no for an answer. So, okay, well, let's, let's find a way to make this work. Because at that point, we were actually going to do three events. We were going to have an event Thursday and Friday at 335. 
disco party at the KI also Friday night and then the Saturday events. I said, well, you know, what if at the bare minimum people are expecting you Saturday night? So can we bring you in for Saturday? And uh, she said, maybe. And uh, she said, it depends where, you know, where we, where we would be at the tour. And we, you know, we don't know the tour locations yet. And I said, well, what if I got you a private plane? Here I go with the private plane. <laughs> Even though I don't have one, but Hey, you know, it buys me time. I can try to find one. And she says, we're meeting with our production direct, uh, production guy tomorrow. I'll get back. To she texts me and she says, if you can get us, fly us in and out with a private plane, we can come in still for Friday and Saturday and only halt the tour for two days. Like, yes. All right. Now I kept, I mean, I, I certainly let you know. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I let the Red Cross know. And obviously Dan knew because he was with me, but I kept it very close to the vest. I didn't tell the rest of the crew just because this is, you know, crisis management. You need to keep it as confined as possible, especially because we had already made a public announcement that they were coming. Mm-hmm. So I didn't want this to start spreading to guests and, or even the team, you know, and them to be disappointed or whatnot. I bought myself some time, give me time to figure it out. And if it comes, we're at the kickoff party and this is still hasn't been resolved, well, then I'll have to say something just because people are going to be excited about it. But exactly. So I reached out working on a plane and now we're into September, so we are like a week or two before the kickoff party. And I don't know if I have the plane. I don't know what's going on with Pete and Max. Well, then she texts me and she says, hey, the tour is, we're going to, we're starting the tour later, so we're back on. We can come. We don't need a private plane. So of course, I'm like, thank you, God. <laughs> I text message. I text and I actually, I'll, I'll tell the story. So it was Paul Kardish, who was, who was part of that 2018 team. He was pinch dancing for Chris Lofgren for Schneider. And I had reached out and I said, hey, could we get, you know, Schneider's plane? And. I text him. I said, Hey man, their tour is off. Don't need the private plane. And ironically he writes back, well, come to find out I would have been able to get the plane had you needed it. So <laughs> and I got a little excited there. Just like, all right, you know, I did finally get a private plane <laughs> in some form or fashion, but mm. all systems go. PETA and Max are going to be there and we have the kickoff party at the mark with all 20 people. And I've got a picture of the poster with that team here that I am punching up and just about to share with you and everybody else. So what a crew. What are you what yes, are your thoughts? What an you, amazing crew. What are your thoughts when you when you look at that? Yeah. Just again, phenomenal people and just getting to know each and every person over the years. It was so fun just seeing them again and being you know, part of people's events. Uh, I wish a couple of our old timers would have came in, uh, um, but you know, that's okay. They supported in other ways and, and um, we're still in the fold, um, but great team. Great team to have that final year with. Absolutely. Uh, it was a great group, fun group. Had a lot, a lot of fun working with them. And now we kept this a secret. So it's part of my friendship with PETA. She has gotten me tickets to Dancing with the Stars, the live TV show in LA. Uh, she had gotten me tickets. I had been there once previously, went in 2015 with my good buddy Spike Meiser, and I had not been back yet. And of course, after I went in 2015, you said, if you ever get the chance to go again, I'm first in line. Exactly. <laughs> I, owe you, I owe you a few favors over the years. So this I'll is, love that. Mm-hmm. This is part of it. So I'm like, okay. And so when I started recruiting them, Pete and Max, I said to you, I'll, I'm certainly going to ask, let's try to go out this fall for the show. And she wrote back instantly. And again, this was back in July when they initially committed. She says, yeah, I can get you two tickets. And you and I had already picked out a date. It was that Monday mm-hmm. after the kickoff party. But I, I didn't want that to be any sort of a distraction at the kickoff. And I, and I don't want anybody to be jealous or upset, not that anybody yeah. would have. Um, but I just told you, I said, you, you can't let anybody know until we're actually out there the day of the show. And then I'll let you post something on social. Uh, I made you stay off of social media the, uh, the entire time until then. But uh, yeah, so we got to go to Dancing with the Stars. And as I put, put these pictures up, uh, tell me what that entire experience was like for you. Oh, it was incredible. Seeing the live production and just how, first of all, the energy in the room, 
and then how they transition in between dances it, with the commercials and the sets was just extraordinary. And when we walked into the ballroom and saw where our seats were, my mouth just like, oh, because uh, we were basically two rows up right behind, here, do your impression. Your Car Carrie Ann Inaba. There you go. <laughs> Len Goodman. <laughs> Bruno Tognoli. Yeah. Oh, that would be it. Um, and so when we watched it back, we could actually, you know, thanks to Sean wearing that red shirt, could see ourselves, you know, very easily. Him more than me, because obviously being shorter, but um, you could totally see his head in his shirt, which then I knew where to look for myself. Um, but, and at that time, um, they didn't let you bring cameras into, or your phone, into the ballroom. And so there was a woman next to us that took the photo and then texted it to, because somehow she got to keep her phone. She snuck uh, her phone in, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then she texts that photo of us uh, afterwards. So I'm happy that we at least got the one photo uh, in the ballroom. Absolutely. And uh, so the way, the way it is for, you know, obviously most people watching this have no clue. You don't get a ticket with a seat number. Uh, what it is, is they, they, they let you in, in in groups, but based on where you're sitting, that's where they have you line up outside of the studio. And then they'll pull people in and then they tell you where to walk. And then, okay, you just look on the chairs and they have your name printed on a piece of paper and it's taped to the chair and that's where you sit. So it's, it's fun because there's that mystery. You're walking in and you're just wondering, mm -hmm. okay, where, where is my name at? Where am I? Where am I going to be sitting? And when I had gone the first time in May of 2015, we were six rows behind Carrie Ann near the aisle. And two times you could barely see my face on there. Otherwise, most of the time you could see like my 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 body from here down. So you could always see I, that I wore a purple shirt and a black tie. So yeah. I saw a lot of that. But again, I didn't care about being on TV. It was just neat. So that's where my eyes went first when we walked in i'm looking back up there okay yeah we're probably going to be back and so i didn't see our names there and then i looked in the fifth row and i didn't see them there and you and then, wanted to go first so you i did I, and i always yeah in, in, every year that we go now i always say let me in first because i want to be yep. the one that hopefully spots it well then when i didn't see it in the back two rows then i just started jumping rows like i mean i wasn't reading them all the way through i just started jumping and all of a sudden it was like boom Right in the middle, Jody Wires, Sean Kaiser, second row behind the judges. O M G. <laughs> exactly. I'm like, we're gonna be. They're gonna be seeing my ugly face on television <laughs> all night long. <laughs> and sure enough, when we finally were able to get our phones back after the show, they were blowing up with people mm -hmm. taking screenshots, of the TVs, and putting it on social, and texting us, and freaking out. And it was so much fun. But uh, in addition to going to the show, we also get to go back lot. Yes. Uh, I guess that would be considered backstage. But everybody has a trailer on this big lot. And you just stand outside the building and wait for people to wait. You know, you mm -hmm. wait for the cast and crew to, uh, to come through. And then you can approach them and get photos. And I didn't include all of your pictures here. Actually, I, I only the only backstage one. Or back lot one I, I included was was these two goofs but uh, <laughs> I mean you were you were going up to Lori Hernandez who didn't yeah, dance that year but definitely. she was she was watching she was watching in attendance and as was Amy Purdy who had been on the show previously so yeah. photos with her and then uh, a lot of the, what's that property brothers yes uh, both of them so that was yeah. what was neat Drew and Scott Right? Yeah. No, or that's no Scott's is that's the last name. That right? last name. Um, oh my gosh. Um I'm drawing a blank here too. Anyway, property brothers. They were right. both on. <laughs> and so one was a contestant, but then they flew the other brother in to be part of the routine that night. And I'll never forget, I spotted him kneeling down. He snuck in and he was kneeling down next to the judges' stage. And I said, Oh my gosh, the other brother is here. And so the brother who was that flew in, he had to fly out right away. But you, he wasn't going to take pictures of anybody. But you just, oh, real quick, real quick. Okay, fine. You know, who can say I no to you, right? 
Mm -hmm. And then I thought the Drew, other Eric, uh, Drew, right? Or did I say that already? Drew and Eric, is that the names? No, that's not it. I, I can't. I, got, I need to look it up now on my phone. Okay. Keep talking. Um, the other really special moment was, or person who danced was Victoria Arlen. And it was the year we were out there, that episode was most memorable year. And uh, I know, Sean, you read her book and then you gave it to me and I just finished reading it. And just an incredible story uh, of, you know, being, I can't remember what, what exactly um, she had. Like, she came down with a, a very rare disease, actually two yeah. very rare diseases, which at the same time, yeah, basically paralyzed her and put her in a coma for uh, years, several years mm -hmm. from the ages of like 11 to 15. Yep. But the family kept the faith and eventually she came out of the coma. Was in and, a wheelchair. And, you know, made a full recovery over a long period of time. She was, you know, paraplegic for, uh, a while thereafter the coma but then eventually regained the use of walking and this she she first started walking i think a year or so before she danced yeah so that's how new all of that was to her and, and it had always been a dream for her to be on the show and yeah an emotional night for her and the opportunity to to get to meet her after and her parents and, yeah, her parents yeah. were so nice you know she talks about them a lot in the book and they were so friendly mm -hmm. um and uh just uh yeah what, what a great experience yeah because we went up and we talked to her and just said how beautiful um her routine was and just i mean they on the show you they, like you could see me like wiping my tears <laughs> right behind carrie ann's head so most, was carrie ann so it was all good <laughs> most memorable is the that's the tearjerker night no doubt about it yeah oh yeah <laughs> So after this, uh, it was, hey man, we're in Hollywood, let's go out to dinner. Let's, <laughs> let's, you know, let's, hang, out. let's hang out with the celebrities. So <laughs> I didn't make any reservations. I had scouted out a few spots in the Hollywood area. We went to one of them and he's like, yeah, if you don't have a reservation, you can't get in. But he was nice enough. I said, well, what do you recommend around here? And he said, well, there's Craig's right up the street. And I'm like, okay, I remember reading about Craig's. So I'm like, yeah, I remember that. Let's let's go to Craig's. And as we're walking there, you see tons of paparazzi standing out front. So you're thinking, all right, well, there's got to be, you know, either somebody cool is, must show up here, or there are already be some big time players that are already in the building. So uh, we get to Craig's, and I heard a name mentioned by the paparazzi, but I'm like, eh, well, we'll see. So you and I walk in. The place was packed. Mm -hmm. I go up, hey, can we get a table? What's the wait? And I said, like, eh, it won't be too long. You know, we'll go grab a cocktail at the bar. And by the time you're done with that, you should be able to get seated. Well, it was actually a lot faster than that. So you're like, okay, go get a drink. I'm going to go freshen up. So I'm standing there. All of a sudden, the guy says, hey, I got your table ready already. I'm like, oh, wow, okay. Hopefully, Jody will see me when I'm sitting down. And they put us, there's like a half wall from the front door going into the restaurant. And we're right up against that half wall. So I'm like, okay, I'm gonna sit so Jody can see the front door and anybody that walks in and then I'll watch the restaurant. And who do I see zip past me? Comedian Dennis Leary. And I'm like, wow, okay, that's that's a big deal. Big tall dude walks in, DeAndre Jordan, NBA basketball player. Holy cow. And then the name that I had heard the paparazzi say comes walking from the bathroom area back out to the dining room and then across my line of sight mm. and holy crap j-lo jennifer lopez and i'm like i mean i'm like if somebody had a camera on me i must have been literally like bouncing in my chair waiting for you to get back and i'm thinking oh my gosh did jody was jody in the bathroom <laughs> <with J -Lo? laughs> get back here now you were just nonchalantly walking back. I think you would have ran back had you ran into jail. Yeah. So I figured you were oblivious. Now you did pass DeAndre Jordan and you're like, that guy must be a basketball player or something. He is tall. Yeah. And I told you who he was and I go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'll tell you about him in a second, but right over there is General Lopez. And you're like, what? And I'm like, keep it cool. And I'm like, were you in the bathroom right there? And you're like, no, because the women's bathrooms there are private, right? They have two women's yeah, bathrooms. So so basically I had a one and two shot of basically coming 
face to face with Jennifer Lopez in the bathroom. So, cause yeah, they had um, two bathrooms for the women that were, you know, private and the one for the men. So um, I jiggle the hand on the first one, it's, you know, locked. Jiggle the hand on the second, locked. So I'm just waiting in the hallway um, for one of the doors to open. And so the door opens and it's one of the servers. And um, so, you know, I go in. So yes, I would have, I, I don't know what I would have done if I, if that door opened and it would have been Jennifer Lopez. <laughs> I would have, yeah. Um, and so after we order a couple courses, I go back to the bathroom so that I can like see her uh, sitting at her table. And cause I didn't want to like, completely crank my neck around to look at her right. and but Sean can attest to she is absolutely stunning like she, she just had like this white tank top on these big hoop earrings hair in a ponytail hardly any makeup and stunning yeah she was wearing shorts mm -hmm. tank top I mean very casual and that's the yeah. tricks you can dress up at Craig's or you can you know mm -hmm. if you're Jennifer Lopez you can dress up you can wear whatever the hell you want yeah, whatever the heck you want <laughs> Um, but yeah, so you get back and then I start seeing these celebrities and I say, okay, we're going to be here like two, two and a half hours. Let's, we're just going to go through the menu really slowly. We're going to have a couple cocktails. We're having dessert. I want to find out who else is coming to this place. Everything. And about 15 minutes later, who comes walking in? Well, her boyfriend, Alex Rodriguez, big time <laughs> baseball player. And it's just like, holy cow, A-Rod's here now. This is un believable so it was a fun experience and then they eventually leave out the back and i i went so then i see them leaving i'm like oh man i, I just need to go see some day rod so i went back by the bathroom and i said hey rod how you doing <laughs> and i i totally biffed it because you had your moment you i it. i saw him play when he was uh for before the timber rattlers they were the appleton foxes and he played there for like two weeks, minor league baseball. And my dad took me to one of those games. And I should have said, hey, A-Rod, love to deal with the Appleton Foxes. How many people talk about the Appleton Foxes to him when he's out in L.A.? Probably nobody. So I probably, he probably would have stopped. J-Lo would have stopped. Heck, I might have been able to get a, a picture with them. Oh, man, that was, I, I totally, totally screwed that one up. Yes, you did. Uh, I guess it wasn't meant to be, but. Mm -hmm. So DeAndre Jordan is sitting in a booth not too far from us, and he was having a really good time. <laughs> and he is so tall. He's, he's pricey seven, seven, yeah. one. His legs literally went across the whole booth to the other side. Like, it was insane how tall he was. So he, uh, you know, now by this point, the restaurant is starting to thin out a little bit. And I felt okay. You know, usually, I mean, I know I've, said someday to A-Rod on, you know, but I wasn't going to go up to their table and respect the space. <laughs> but at this point, you know, DeAndre was feeling good and the place was filtering out. And more than anything, we had, uh, he wasn't going to, again, nobody says no to you, especially because of the height difference. So that was the angle that we took when we went up to him and said, hey, you know, big fan, whatever, here from Wisconsin. And of course he, the Packers had just defeated the Cowboys the day before Aaron Rodgers. It was down in Dallas, last second touchdown. And he's a huge Cowboys fan. So he used some sort of an ex, uh, expletive, uh, blank Green Bay. But we <laughs> laughed about it. And then we say, can we get a picture? I mean, you know, this girl right here, you know, is 5'3", five, 5'4". Five, and you're a giant. And he's like, yeah, absolutely. But Well, and at first he was well, like. Well, I said, can we get a photo? Yeah. And he's thinking, all right, yeah, just, you know, come around. Go ahead. Yeah. You tell the story. Yeah. He was like, yeah, come around. And I was like, uh-uh. I said, you need to stand up. <laughs> I said, because I'm getting one with you standing up. Because I'm only 5'3". And I don't know how tall you are. <laughs> so he does. And there you go. I mean. Yes. I literally could fit under his armpit. Yeah, if he had his arm out, you wouldn't even reach the armpit. Mm hmm Yeah, so, nice guy, though. Super nice. Oh, he was great. He was great. Yeah, fun super time. fun. Well, now it's it's back to business. Uh, and actually, I, I will say, so on our flight out to Los Angeles, we did do business. We knew it was a good opportunity. It's three-and-a-half-hour flight 
actually, well, on the way out there, four, because you're going against the jet stream. So about a four-hour flight. And we saw one more celebrity sighting on the way back, too. Uh, if anybody watched the Project Runway, uh, with Southwest, you pick your seats. And if you, like, check in later, you might be one of the last ones on or, or um, you know, last to sit, and you just kind of get what you get. So we had a seat near the window. And um, early when I we were waiting, I was like, "Oh, I'm like that dude's Dexter from uh, Project Runway." And um, so then, sure enough, he comes into the plane, and I'm the only seat left, and there may be one other. I was like, "Oh, you can sit here." So I sat next to him, like on the plane, and um, so you know, BS with him a little bit, and he was going to Milwaukee um, for some fundraiser there. And it was hilarious when we were landing and stuff because he's never seen like, um, you know, snow or he's never seen like just farm field. Well, I guess it wasn't snowing then, but he's never saw like farm fields or cows. And he's all like, oh my God, look at those. <laughs> oh, it was funny. <laughs> that was funny. But on the flight out there, we knew we had four hours to work. So you, uh, you brought your little iPad and you said, hey, let's, let's put together the, the volunteer needs and all of that stuff. So, you know, let's do a little bit of a deeper dive on that and what all goes into that and, you know, talk about all the different duties that volunteers serve for Dancing with Our Stars uh, for that last, that last event. Right. Well, because we were doing a two-night event. And so from that standpoint, okay, what do we need from, for the disco ball party? Logistics, volunteer needs, uh, time frame, kind of walk through all those pieces, and then event night, you know, how are we going to walk through those pieces as well? Absolutely, and so there's the, this was at the event, Peter and Max being nice enough to take a photo with uh, a lot of the volunteers, and yeah, you've got, we always had greeters at every possible way that people could show up, to the event and you know flow people okay hey you know we have more bars here or you need to you know we want to go in the ballroom you can do this you can do that and i mean we just you know we went through the event with a fine tooth comb and what are areas where we need some sort of staffing and right. we did it i mean we we had one heck of a robust spreadsheet and then okay yeah, who can do double duty if somebody's working this and then that ends who can do this yeah. Programs and then, out. Go ahead. Well, Sean learned his lesson from the year I danced. Yeah. So, yeah. So let's go back to that. So, yeah, as we talked about in part two of your episode, uh, I was MC and event manager, uh, executive producer, as well as volunteer coordinator. And that was a disaster. So, okay, Jody, we need to find somebody else to do it. So, uh, who did we find and talk about her? Molly. Uh, she helped run Dan's throwback proms previously, and she oh, was phenomenal. Molly Lucarelli, school yes. teacher. Yep. And I mean, she has a clipboard. Woman She's right there in the middle in the blue, in the yep. blue dress right there. Mm -hmm. And she even made me a bedazzled clipboard uh, so that when, before I was turned into dancer again, I could have my little clipboard too. And so I knew going into the event that, you know, everything was in amazing hands because Molly is fantastic. She's organized. She's level-headed. She can problem solve uh, and, you know, just phenomenal. So when we were all kind of getting set up and um, before we opened up the doors, um, I was already already and we had a little volunteer huddle and that's where i basically handed the clipboard off to molly and that was that was a really an emotional um time for me too and um just again I'm, oh, i was all good i'm crying again now <laughs> um and you know just to thank everybody for their you know all their years of support and their dedication and their commitment and um you know just to to have everybody there again um supporting and to know that this was the last year that this team was going to be getting ready 
uh, and coming together for this event. Um, it was, it was emotional. Molly's great. And you prepped her because you had her volunteer the previous year yep. under you. So then she was able to get a feel for, for how it went, but absolutely no concerns whatsoever. You, we knew we were in good hands with her and, Again, that's a huge piece. The volunteer management aspect of the event is is almost as big, if not as big as the event itself, just because the event wouldn't happen without the volunteers. 